This is not CNN, so I have never talked about this on TV before, but hey, how about that poop cruise? The poop cruise, also known as the Carnival Triumph, the cruise ship that was stuck for five days in the Gulf of Mexico with more than 4,000 people on board and no working toilets. It happened in February. I will not go on and on about the details. You've probably heard them, but perhaps this one line from one passenger's pending lawsuit against Carnival Cruises will suffice to give you the basic idea. Quote, plaintiff was forced to wade through human feces in order to reach food lines only to receive rations of spoiled food. Here also is a picture of people on board the cruise ship trying to use their bodies to spell the word help for the purposes of news helicopters. It's a little hard to make out. But I mean, you kind of see, right? Okay, there we go. We've helped, we've helped them. This, this was a nightmare, even without the wall-to-wall -wall tabloid TV coverage. It was just a real low point for the cruise industry in particular. I mean, whoever is going to book a cruise, again, after the poop cruise? If you worked in the cruise industry, you might be worried about the long-term impact of the poop cruise on your whole business, right? Turns out, no, not really super concerned. A chief executive of a European cruise line called MSC was quoted right after the poop cruise thing, saying that the industry was pretty confident that nobody was ever going to remember this. The CEO reminded Reuters that actually the cruise industry had had a really disastrous year in 2012 as well. 2012, of course, included the Costa Concordia nightmare when that cruise ship ran aground and killed 32 people. That was 2012. But the CEO told Reuters that people forgot about even that fatal incident in 2012 right away. So it stands to reason, he said, that even if 2013 is the year of the poop cruise, by next year, by 2014, people will have forgotten all about it. He said, quote, it's amazing how 2012 has been forgotten. We have seen already the new wave season, 2013, that the first comers are coming back again. So in other words, poop cruise, schmoop cruise, people forget, doesn't matter. It was the same line from another crisis management expert interviewed after the poop cruise debacle. He said, quote, Americans have short memories. Americans have short memories. So that's idea number one from the business world. Here's idea number two. Uh, this was the president of the United States on May 1st, 2003. Ten years ago next week, President George W. Bush putting on a fake flight suit complete with the ejection harness and everything, and he did a fake fighter pilot landing under the USS Abraham Lincoln from an S-3 Viking jet. The US Abraham Lincoln was, USS Abraham Lincoln was carrying soldiers returning home after an 11-month deployment, but before they got to go home, they got lined up to watch as President Bush stripped off his flight suit, put on his suit, stood in front of a giant banner that said, mission accomplished, and gave a speech where he said the Iraq war effectively was over. And it wasn't just over, it was awesome. My fellow Americans, major combat operations in Iraq have ended. In the Battle of Iraq, the United States and our allies have prevailed. That was day 43 of the Iraq war that would go on to last eight and a half more years. So idea number one, the poop cruise idea, is that Americans have short memories. Idea number two is that we are fast approaching the 10-year anniversary of the Mission Accomplished speech on May 1st. So next week is the 10-year anniversary. These are two seemingly unrelated ideas that nevertheless offer the best help I can string together for understanding the public relations onslaught we are now enduring as a nation. You've probably noticed over the past 24 hours a very familiar face all over your TV. Like, like this interview on CBS, for example, that featured either the most impressive segue ever or a really strange edit. Watch. Some argue that, and, and I think Karl Rove has said this, if there had been no weapons of mass destruction, probably the decision would not have been made. It's hard to tell. And what does painting bring you? Uh, relaxation and a whole new way of looking at the world. So, cool with the war? Yeah, whatever. Painting? So relaxing. CBS got one of these interviews. Fox News got two and aired two of these interviews an hour apart on the same night. Uh, one of them on the left there, that's Dana Perino interviewing President Bush. Dana Perino now works at Fox News, but she used to have a different job. She was President Bush's White House press secretary. So her getting the interview, it's kind of all in the family. The event that's supposed to warrant all this news coverage today was the big stately ceremony dedicating the George W. Bush Presidential Library. All five living U.S. presidents were there. All the first ladies, except for Nancy Reagan, were there. Heads of state from around the world. The presidents all spoke and had very kind words for President Bush. President Bush spoke about his friendship with Dick Cheney. He talked about other stuff, too. 
My deepest conviction, the guiding principle of the administration, is that the United States of America must strive to expand the reach of freedom. When future generations come to this library and study this administration, they're going to find out that we stayed true to our convictions. If that alone, Mr. Bush's cadence and style and doctrine, if that alone is not enough to stir memories of how it all actually went for all those years, take note also that today was just the private opening. The first day the general public can go visit the George W. Bush Library will be next week. The first day the general public can go will specifically be May 1st, May 1st, 2013, 10 years to the day after this happened on May 1st, 2003. They are opening the George W. Bush Presidential Library to the public on the 10-year anniversary of the Mission Accomplished speech, which is either an inside joke or this is some kind of crisis management business school test of the poop cruise thesis that Americans really do have very shockingly short memories. It's the honor of a lifetime to lead a country as brave and as noble as the United States. Whatever challenges come before us, I will always believe our nation's best days lie ahead. God bless. Former President George W. Bush at the end of his 13-minute speech in Texas today, dedicating his presidential library. Joining us now is Wayne Slater, he's senior political writer for the Dallas Morning News. He's co-author of the seminal Bush administration user's manual called Bush's Brain. Wayne was there today for the dedication. Wayne, thanks so much for being here. Great to be with you, Rachel, as always. You know, when I saw that clip, I had read before that President Bush teared up at the end of his speech, um, but I didn't know it was quite as dramatic as it was until I saw the clip. Do you have, having been there, do you have any insight into him becoming so emotional at the end of his speech? What else was going on there? Yeah, I mean, I mean you know George Bush. Uh, he's the guy who says, I don't want to be uh, psychoanalyzed on the couch. I don't want to be so emotional. I don't want to look this way. And yet you saw a very emotional guy today. And to be honest, this was a moment I think he recognized it's over. I mean, it's really, really over. The monument has been built. That's the end of a long process. And I think what's very important to him was his mom and dad were there. Not only did you have the alumni, the extended Bush uh, legacy project network, but you had mom and dad. And frankly, I don't want to say too much about it, but anyone who watched that moment where George Bush 41 talked briefly, we all know our parents won't last forever. And I think he was awfully happy that they were there on this day. When I have found it to be um, noteworthy and strange and sort of surprised that it's not bigger news, that the date they picked for the public opening of the library is the 10-year anniversary of Mission Accomplished. It's not even like the random 16th anniversary, which nobody would notice. It's 10 years. Is that an, is that an oversight? It seems like impossibly <laughs> awkward timing. I talked to a guy today in the crowd, a couple people in the crowd, one of whom said, it was talking about the accomplishments of the Bush administration. Iraq was an accomplishment, flat oh. out. So there are those folks, the Bushies, the loyalists, uh, who consider virtually everything he did as a great accomplishment, uh, history be damned. Uh, but on the other hand, I think if, in fact, the folks at the Bush Library, the Bush who were putting this thing together, had really thought this thing through, they probably wouldn't have wanted this to be on the 10-year anniversary uh, if they really thought that that was no big deal, that America's uh, short-term memory uh, would be completely vanished, uh, you know, 10 years later, which is obviously not the case, we would see the banner inside the library. Rachel, the banner ain't there. Was there any substantial mention other than conversations like you had in the crowd there? Was there any substantial mention of Iraq? Was that word mentioned today from the podium? No. Amazing. No. Not once. The, the most significant thing to define the Bush administration, the Iraq war, a decade of war, the word Iraq was never mentioned. Now, uh, war, the word war is word, uh, something about a dictator, uh, and a whole lot of uh, sentences that had the word freedom in them. That's the word that Bush uses, freedom, as a kind of cloak to cover everything. So Iraq, the most significant thing, 
was never spoken from the stage. Astonishing. Uh, astonishing. Wayne Slater, uh, senior political writer with the Dallas Morning News, co-author of Bush's Brain, How Karl Rove Made George W. Bush. Wayne, it's always great to have you here. Thank you so much. Great to be with you. Thank you.